Welcome back to the lab, everyone. Today I'll be walking you through the digestive structures on the cat. Okay, so let's start looking at the digestive structures on the feline specimen. So the first thing I'd like to point out is in the head right here, we have the left parotid salivary gland. So this right here is going to be the left masseter muscle. You remember that from AMP1. And you actually have to go more towards the ear up here. And this gland, that's real close to the ear, that is the parotid gland. And because we're on the left side of the kitty, this is the left parotid gland. Then here, you'll remember this also from AMP1. Remember that the esophagus is posterior, okay, human terms, posterior to the trachea. So that trachea is going to be that ribbed structure. We're actually gonna look at that in a couple of weeks in my class. And so that flat flesh colored tube is going to be the esophagus. All right, so now we are in the abdominal cavity, um, different parts of the stomach, which is right here. Um, this area in humans, we call that the cardia. This is the fundus. Remember that's that top kind of bulging portion of the stomach. This is the greater curvature. This is the lesser curvature. And then this end of the stomach is called the pylorus. So let's go ahead and open this up. Inside here, this is where the esophagus opens up into the stomach. In uh, our lab with our um, torso models and our models of the human stomach, you guys have to know that cardiac sphincter. Inside, we also have these folds called gastric folds or rugi. Those are important. So remember, anytime you see folds or lines in the body, what that's going to do is going to create more surface area. So if need be, these rugi will help the stomach expand and those will actually disappear as the stomach fills up. Again, we have the pylorus and we have another sphincter there. This is the pyloric sphincter. And the pyloric sphincter is really important because it's going to um, play a part in, in the role of gastric motility and, and the passage of food from the stomach in to that first part of the small intestine. Attached to the greater curvature is something we saw in AMP1, and that is the greater omentum. So if we were to gently unfold this, you could see how that is attached to the greater curvature. That is that fatty apron that lies over the abdominal pelvic organs. So think greater curvature, greater omentum. Then the lesser curvature is going to be where the lesser omentum attaches. Okay, so this is part of it right here. There's not much of that, but just think. Lesser curvature, lesser omentum, greater curvature, greater omentum. Let's go now into the small intestine. So remember that first part of the small intestines, the shortest part, so in humans, it's about 10 inches, obviously not 10 inches in the kitty, um, but that first part's called the duodenum. The middle po portion is called the jejunum, for humans, that makes up about seven and a half feet or so of the small bowel. Um, so if we were to just keep going and follow this, you know, all of this right here is jejunum. And then the ilium, which is the distal end of the small bowel, 
that is the longest portion in humans. That's about 11 and a half feet. So the easiest way to identify that on the kitty, get all of this situated, is to find the large intestine. So a review of something I mentioned in AMP1, and you can review that um, organ systems and serous membranes video I made for AMP1. How do we know small intestine from large intestine? Like I say frequently, the name tells us a lot about what it should look like. So notice that this tube right here is a lot wider than this tube right here. So this is clearly the small intestine, and then this is clearly the large intestine. So always have a reference. It's, it's really hard to memorize these things on, its, on their own, and sometimes you have to, but whenever you can, compare. So when you find that, that large intestine, you know the ileum is going to be the distal end of the intestine and the part that's gonna connect directly to that large intestine. So the large intestine, which is also called the colon, in cats, um, they have ascending, transverse, descending. They have flexures just like we do. So this, remember those flexures are those turns. So this would be the hepatic flexure and this would be the splenic flexure. Or for us, you know, we call this the right colic flexure or the left colic flexure. My opinion is that hepatic and splenic are easier to memorize because we know we're pretty familiar with those organs by now. So um, here, if we were to open up the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine, let me put it in my hand so you can see it better. Small intestine, large intestine. We open that up. Here we have the ileocecal valve. If I can keep this open, okay. So this thing that looks like a little belly button, little any belly button, that is the ileocecal valve. And just think, ileocecal is a compound word. It's made up of ileocecal. In humans, this is where we would find that vermiform appendix, but kitties do not have one. So that's not a structure you'd have to find on a feline, feline specimen. Um, let's see, so um, other organs we have here. Let's talk about the accessory organs. Again, we have a very large liver and this little small thing, it looks like a little deflated balloon. That is the gallbladder. So let me get this in better light. This is actually a very, very nice gallbladder on this kitty. So that is the gallbladder. And we have the pancreas. The pancreas is, my, in my personal opinion, the hardest organ to find on the cat. So we have to flip everything over and then it's, depending on what specimen, I've seen it a couple different colors. Sometimes it's this flesh colored, other times it's this kind of grayish color right here, but it's, it's mixed up in the greater omentum. So if you find, find the stomach, go to that greater curvature, kind of flip everything up. Here's that spleen, that flesh colored or gray colored organ is going to be the pancreas. And I've seen them in all different shapes, meaning they don't all look stringy like this. Sometimes they have a very nice, well-defined pancreas. Other times, most of the time, in my experience, um, they look like this. So another hint for the, identifying the pancreas is that remember, the pancreas is going to attach to the duodenum because it's going to be dumping enzymatic juices in there. So an, another trick I like to tell students is if you can find that duodenum, which is that first part of the small intestine, then you can find the pancreas. And then last but certainly not least, let's look at the peritoneal extensions associated with the bowel. So with the small intestine, if we were to pull, gently pull this outwards like this, this real nice translucent membrane, that is the mesentery. This is actually 
visceral peritoneum. So if you remember that from last semester, remember visceral meaning it's touching the organ itself, peritoneum because we're in the peritoneal cavity. So that serous membrane is actually gonna go over the bowel and then this is a double layer. You're, this side you're seeing, on, on this side you're seeing this, this portion. On the other side, you're seeing that portion and together it makes this, this nice membrane. So the mesentery, associate that with the small intestine. For the mesocolon, as you can imagine, you would identify that with the colon. So that's simply the mesentery. So mesentery is kind of a generalized term um, for these peritoneal extensions, but really most people, when they think mesentery, they think of this as mesentery. So that's why I'm saying that word. But that tissue that's uh, associated with the colon, that would be the mesocolon.